If you take a look at slide number 131, you can see an example of severe dorsal angulation, radial shortening, with little to no inclination at all. On slide number 132, this is demonstration of this person's range of motion with this fracture, malunion. Currently, there's no consensus about which one parameter is used to be the most specific predictor of a symptomatic malunion, because some patients may have that specific malunion and absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Others may have a lesser degree of malunion and they have extreme pain and symptoms that are constantly interfering with their functional use of their hand. Therefore, the radial length, the radial inclination, the volar tilt, the articular congruity must all be evaluated with each and every distal radius fracture. And anatomic must be corrected as close to possible in order to get the least chances of a malunion or deformity. Patients that have step-offs will likely end up with distal radial ulnar joint arthritis unless they're treated early enough. If distal radial ulnar joint arthritis is not present, but the patient has a shortening and angulation, the physician can perform a corrective osteotomy of the distal radius to try and recreate the tilt as well as recreate radial inclination. If the radial articular alignment is all right, then an ulnar shortening osteotomy can be used to shorten the ulna and decrease that ulnar load. That can be done with a Rahaf device. And when arthritis is present, the physician can perform salvage techniques such as a DARA, a Suave Kapanji, or a Bowers Hemi resection. And we'll take a look at some of these. If you take a look at slide number 135, the arrow points clearly to an articular step off, which causes so much pain and dysfunction in this particular patient that a more aggressive means of intervention must need to be taken. What are these salvage procedures for extreme pain and disruption? The DARA, the Suave Kapanji, the Bowers Hemi resection, a one bone forearm, distal ulna arthroplasties, total wrist fusions or total wrist arthroplasties are most commonly seen. If you take a look at slide number 137, you'll see an example of a DARA. The distal ulna is resected in this procedure. It is reserved for the elderly, less active, or rheumatoid patients because you can have problems with this ulnar stump that is resultant and causes instability patterns at some point. Slide 138 depicts a diagrammatic of a Suave Kapanji procedure. In this procedure, fusion of the distal radial ulnar joint, which is very likely at that point symptomatic, and creating a pseudoarthrosis in the distal ulna proximal to the fusion is performed. Rotation that occur at that pseudoarthrosis. Ulnar support for the carpus is preserved. The TFCC and the extensor carpi ulnaris remain stabilized. Problems with this instability with the ulnar stump are also an issue. And they are more common when instability was present preoperatively. Slide 139 depicts the Bowers Hemi resection and inter interposition arthroplasty. This is a popular technique involving resection only of the articular portion of the distal ulna and the interposing soft tissue to prevent radial ulnar impingement or the distal radial ulnar joint dysfunction that you've been report the patient's been reporting. It does not correct the ulnar plus deformity or the distal radial ulnar joint instability pattern. It does not address those issues. The distal ulnar implant, as depicted on slide 140, may be another promising option. One bone forearm technique will create one bone to provide stability and eliminate pain, but sacrifices all rotation. So this technique is rarely performed. We do not have a picture of this technique. 141 depicts the Schecker distal radial ulnar joint prosthesis, which is a promising device.